where in the infinite money diagram, FTX would create the uh, FTT, which is their own cryptocurrency, right? They would then lend it over to Alameda, right? Alameda would then take the FTT, which is a worthless asset by all account, will take it and go take uh, borrow money against it, right? Free money. And that's how they can repeat the cycle by take, borrowing FTT from FTX and borrowing money against it and, and getting free money this way. Hey guys, welcome to yet another video with the Financial Controller. This is Bill Hanna here, a licensed CPA in the great state of New York. And in this channel, we've covered a few fraud cases in the past, like Enron, WorldCom, Wirecard, Luck and Coffee. Um, I'm gonna leave a link to the playlist in the description below. But in this video, I wanted to cover FTX and its bankruptcy in November of 2022, right? So what we do is I'm gonna give you my unique perspective from a controller perspective or the accounting side of things on what happened in this case. And I'm gonna save, uh, save the juiciest aspect till the end, the auditors. Why did they have two different auditors and the independents, were they really independent? So we'll cover that toward the end. But what we'll do is we'll cover a quick timeline of events from the founding of the company all the way to its bankruptcy in November 2022. And then we'll go over these four points coming right up. So stick around. All right, so first a quick overview of what happened. And the story begins in 2014 with this guy here, Sam Bankman Fried, who graduates MIT with a degree in physics and by all accounts, a super bright guy who interns for a company called Jane Street as a trader. And then after graduation, he goes to work full time as a trader and he begins to make a name for himself. And he's fascinated by the concept of cryptocurrency. And he gains enough experience working for Jane Street to then decide to go out on his own and begin Alameda, which is his own cryptocurrency trading firm, which does really well. In fact, one of the stories is that he traded uh, Bitcoin in Japan playing on a mismatch of the value in the US versus Japan for Bitcoin and made $20 million on one trade. So he does really well in Alameda and makes enough money to then begin the next chapter, which is in 2019, starting FTX. Now FTX is an entirely different business model than Alameda. Alameda is a cryptocurrency trading firm. They make money from trading, buying low, selling high. With FTX, it's an exchange. So now they make their money on a fee from the platform uh, and people depositing and making trades on the exchange. And FTX began to appear as though it's doing really well. It raises Series A, B, and C. And in fact, in 2022, they closed Series C at a valuation of $32 billion. And this super high valuation of $32 billion was in early 2022. But then fast forward in the year to September of 2022 when Bloomberg.com, uh, Matt Levine, and Coindesk publish uh, articles talking about some interesting aspects of what's going on at FTX. One of the things they noted is the interesting relationship between Alameda and FTX. Now, these are two separate companies, right? They have one common denominator, which is uh, Sam Bankman Freed, who is a major controller or shareholder of the two companies. And the interesting relationship where Alameda is a large holder of FTT. Now, FTT is sitting on the balance sheet of FTX as one of their major assets, right? This is a cryptocurrency that uh, FTX had mined and created or invented. Uh, and Alameda is a biggest, uh, the bigger uh, holder of that FTT cryptocurrency. After these two articles by Bloomberg.com and Coindesk were published, citing the interesting relationship and less than closer relationship between FTX and Alameda, where Alameda is a major holder of FTT, the, the cryptocurrency invented or made by FTX, the market began to get nervous around FTT, right? And one of the major holders of FTT was Binance. Binance is another cryptocurrency exchange, right? That's a competition or a competitor to FTX. They decided to sell their FTT holdings, which was about $500 million, and that created a bank run. And in a bank run, all of the customers uh, ran to FTX to claim their money, basically cash in their chips, right? To get their money back. And that created the bank run and forced FTX to file for chapter 11 bankruptcy because they didn't have enough money or liquid assets on the balance sheet to cover all of these customer deposits. All right, so now that we've covered a quick overview of the story, I wanna share with you four main bullet points as my perspective as a controller from the accounting side so that if you're an accountant or an auditor out there, you can develop a perspective. And when you see something similar to this uh, going on, you can then raise your hand and say, wait a minute, something is wrong here. Uh, so we'll begin with FTX's balance sheet. And this is not a public company. So FTX 
uh, is it doesn't have a 10K to get this information from. Uh, this is just the information that I pieced together by reading articles like Bloomberg.com by Matt Levine and Coindesk. What you see here as an observation is that you have customer deposits as a liability, $16 billion. Typically, what you'd want to see from the accounting side is that the assets will be liquid enough for you that if the customers will come in to cash in the deposits, you're able to um, have the cash to meet these liabilities, right? Uh, but what's happening here is the quality of the assets, right? So normally the best thing to have is cash or cash equivalent, right? Maybe commercial paper, right? Easily liquidate, you can liquidate the cash. Uh, maybe the second best thing would be equities in public companies. You can easily sell them and convert the cash. Or maybe the third best thing would be like Bitcoin, which is a cryptocurrency, but has a market and you can go and sell it and convert to cash. But what they have, the main assets they have in the balance sheet is FTT, which is a cryptocurrency that they made up and they created the value around it. And the value of it was closely tied to the, the value of the company FTX itself, right? FTT and then Serum token, which is another cryptocurrency that they invented or mined. Um, and so there weren't enough market readily available for these to be converted. And that's what happened when they declared bankruptcy, when the, the bank run happened and all the customers came rushing asking for their money, uh, they couldn't liquidate these things. So this is the first observation is that even though the balance sheet is balancing in terms of numbers, but the quality of what's in the asset side isn't liquid enough to meet uh, the customer demands or the customer deposit if they come asking for their money. All right, the second observation I have or an accounting problem is accounting for crypto mining. Now, crypto mining or accounting for crypto mining is different than accounting for when you buy Bitcoin. So like say Tesla, Tesla goes out and buy Bitcoin, they hold it as an intangible asset and they will uh, only record impairment if it goes down in value and can only record gain when they sell it, right? So here though, it's mining because FTX is making FTT. They're actually mining or inventing a cryptocurrency. Right. So because of the lack of guidance from the FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board around cryptocurrency, they're yet to create guidance around the recording. Generally, the recording goes something like this. And again, we don't have a 10K from FTX. It's not a public company, but generally the accounting goes debit to an asset and credit to revenue at the fair market value. Now, this is the tricky point here. Fair market value. What is the fair market value in this case? Well, FTX, because of the relationship with Alameda, who, who is buying that FTT, can easily say, well, Alameda is, will, is willing to buy our FTT that we're mining at, say, $10, or whatever the price is, I don't know how much is per token. And that's how they can establish their market value. Basically, essentially, in my view, as a controller, this is a way for them to inflate the revenue and inflate the asset uh, by saying, this is the fair market value that we want to book it at because we have a customer here waiting to buy it while this customer isn't at arm's length, right? This is a related company because they have the common denominator, uh, Sam Bankman Freed. Um, so this is the second observation I have, which segues into the third observation, which is the relationship between FTX and Alameda. Now with this very interesting relationship between the two companies here, there were three things that were happening. The first one is that Alameda is helping establish a fair market value for the inflating of the asset and revenue for FTX. That's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, FTX was taking customer deposits and lending it to Alameda as a loan uh, at a time where Bitcoin was taking a hit, uh, Alameda was losing money, um, and the customer deposits, they were about $10 billion, according to Bloomberg.com, $10 billion of the $16 billion was lent over to Alameda, right? And then the third thing, which is something that I read uh, at a Reddit thread that says, uh, it's called, I think, the infinite money diagram, where in the infinite money diagram, FTX would create the uh, FTT, which is their own cryptocurrency, right? They would then lend it over to Alameda, right? Alameda would then take the FTT, which is a worthless asset by all account, will take it and go take uh, borrow money against it, right? Free money. And that's how they can repeat the cycle by take, borrowing FTT from FTX and borrow money against it and, and getting free money this way. So that's as far as the relationship between the two sister companies, Alameda and FTX. Uh, and now the fourth observation is I have is regarding the auditors of FTX. Now, they have two different auditors. So I want to comment on why two auditors in this case, and also the independence is called to question the independence of the auditor in this case. 
All right, so for the year ended December 31st, 2021, FTX used two different accounting firms to audit its operation. In the US, for the US subsidiary, they used Armanino LP. And for the Bahama or the Caribbean subsidiaries, they used Prager. Now, using two different accounting firms leaves just enough room for the company to hide some of the unsavory or uh, transactions that are intercompany that are not completely at arm's length, right? The right way was to do was to hire one more global reach accounting firm to do the entire audit so that they have an oversight and they see the entire picture of all of the intercompany transactions. Now, the second problem or observation that I see here with the auditor is independence. So generally, an auditor needs to establish independence from its audit client. In this case, though, Armanino LP was publishing things on social media like Twitter and things like that that didn't exactly scream independence right they seem to be the Wall Street Journal put it as they were that she acting as a cheerleader for FTX and it didn't show a lot of independence and that was the second observation that I've seen the independence wasn't exactly established between the auditor and the audit client and that's the other issue that I see here and that's all I have for today thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one